Tonight, you're going to hear from some amazing thinkers, some amazing writers, some amazing orators. And a lot of them have differing opinions. And in this quote unquote liberal idea of the marketplace of ideas, a lot of us have a tendency to kind of butt heads over the issues that we think are strategic or moral. And tonight you're going to hear things that might be unsettling. Tonight you'll hear things that whatever your political or moral compass has for yourself, you might want to stand up, you might want to yell, you might want to say you disagree with it. And for that reason, we've created a system where there are note cards here tonight. And if you guys don't have a note card, please raise your hand. Okay, a note card will go to you guys. If you guys don't need a note card, pass it off to someone who does need one. And what we hope to do is we hope to give everyone a space to get their thoughts out through these note cards and to the moderators so that this conversation can happen in a respectful and civil manner. It's very important that no matter how deplorable you find one idea on either side, that you don't stand up and you don't make this a road into an argument. What's happening tonight here is historic. It involves a lot of great people, and I would encourage you to kind of honor the, the system that's happening here. Um, introducing the speakers is Sarah Leonard. She's an editor at Descent Magazine. Um, she also co-authored or, or co-edited the um, Occupy, um, the Gazette, a phenomenal and beautifully designed journal. Um, she's someone I look up to a great deal, and I think she's the perfect person to introduce this very uh, ragtag group of unbelievable individuals we have at the table right now. So give Sarah a round of applause, and if you're looking for any of the cards, <laughs> the cards are around the edge of the room. The last thing I have to say is if you have an iPhone or if you're live streaming, to please try to keep your cameras pointed forward. We want to respect the privacy and safety of the people that are in the room. And so we're asking people not to film people in the crowd, but film the people that are up front. Thank you so much. And let's hope tonight will be a great night. Hello. 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 Have you been following the strike in Chicago? Yeah. All right. Um, how many of you were involved with Occupy? Woo! All right. All right. Uh, I will proceed to preach to the choir. Um, okay. So I'm here to give just a quick introduction uh, to the topic, which is over diversity of tactics and the black bloc. Um, so I'm going to start for those who don't have it with a very brief history of the black bloc and go from there. Um, this is a tactic that started in the 80s in Germany, particularly in response to violent police evictions of squatters, um, anti-nuclear activists, um, among others. Um, it's persisted as an element in European social movements, um, anti-austerity movements throughout the Eurozone, um, and famously in America in the battle for Seattle in 1999 at the WTO protests. Um, this is where famously black blocks smashed windows of international corporations, Starbucks, The Gap. Some of you may know the excellent song by Against Me. Um, and most recently, black block tactics have been employed in Occupy. Um, so uh, for those who don't know, uh, this is your friendly black blocker. It involves dressing in black, covering your face, anonymity and solidarity with an affinity group willing to engage in illegal actions. Um, we're here because uh, last winter, uh, journalist Chris Hedges over there wrote, quote, the black bloc anarchists who have been active on the streets in Oakland and other cities are the cancer of the Occupy movement, close quote. Um, he accused them of uh, knee-jerk antipathy to organization, hyper-masculinity, and of turning a protest whose success depended on its Gandhian principles of anti-violence into sort of a battle that most Americans cannot relate to. Um, David Graeber, who some of you may know, um, an activist and anthropologist, author of Debt, um, all around Occupy guy, um, countered that the black bloc is a tactic, not a group, and that Hedges put fellow activists in danger by singling them out to be excised from the movement. Susie Cagle, a journalist covering Oakland, noted that regardless of activist tactics, the media regularly failed to report police actions as violence. Um, and there's little that activists could do about that. 
Um, she also noted that black box in many instances helped the larger protest, um, for instance, by cutting through a fence to get people out of a kettle. Um, and they both noted, along with Crime Think, who's a co-sponsor of the event tonight, um, that the definition of violence depended on framing. The Egyptian protests that removed Mubarak were dubbed peaceful, but involved, of course, throwing rocks at police officers, setting police stations on fire. Um, but these were dubbed peaceful protests. Um, additionally, of course, the first window to be broken in Occupy in New York was a cop putting someone's head through a window. Um, so there's a lot of the question of what defines violence is going to be discussed tonight. Um, so our esteemed panelists are going to talk a little bit about what um, what it means to to what what defines violence within a social movement, what its place is, um, and so I'm going to raise one sort of last question of context rather than getting into what they are going to discuss. Um, so. We're having this discussion about tactics when Occupy is, in fact, no longer in the street. It may be again, but it's not now. Um, and it's a little difficult to have a discussion of appropriate tactics without um, a sense of the context in which you're going to deploy them. Um, Occupy has been ideologically diverse from the get-go. Um, it admirably drew a cross-section of the country, and it, from the get-go, included anarchists. Um, socialists and sort of labor people used to a higher degree of sort of organization. Um, and a lot of liberal students, working people, who may not have a huge amount of experience on the left, but were very committed to the movement. Um, and they're typically sort of disillusioned with Obama, unhappy with Wall Street. Um, many, many of these people who are sort of newcomers to left, left politics in a sense, um, are, I think, I, I think that sort of diversity within the movement makes this conversation extremely valuable. So when you, when you think about tactics, when you make choices, what is at stake? What are the histories of these tactics? Um, the debate over tactics has been a little bit muddled, I think, in part because with the diversity of people within the movement, I'm going to wrap up. Um, you have a diversity of goals. And it's a little difficult to talk about what is the appropriate tactic without having a sense of what the appropriate goal is that you are working toward. And so I would say that now as we begin um, you know, discussing, discussing tactics between people with fairly different ideological orientations probably and what they want out of Occupy, it may in fact raise the question, and perhaps this will be brought up in the questions, um, you know, if Occupy returns to the street, it's not clear to me how we'll continue this discussion here without the discussion that has long been avoided within Occupy, which is what are we fighting for? What, is, what are the specific things that we want? And so I will leave you with that. I'm going to introduce our lovely moderator, and then I will leave you to the debate. Um, our moderator is uh, Sujatha Fernandez um, of the CUNY Grad Center. She is an associate professor of sociology at Queens College and the Graduate Center, City University of New York. She's the author of several books on urban politics and culture. The latest is Close to the Edge in Search of the Global Hip Hop Generation, um, published by Versa. She has written about the Occupy movement and recent global uprisings for the New York Times and the Huffington Post. So give them a hand. Thank you, Sarah. The Center for Place, Culture, and Politics is pleased to host tonight's event. The center is a nexus of critical scholarship at the CUNY Grad Center, and it's directed by the Marxist urban geographer, David Harvey. David, whose scholarship many of you are no doubt familiar with, will be in conversation with Chris Hedges later this month at the Brooklyn Book Festival on September 23rd, so you can check their website for details. You can also, also stay informed about future events hosted by the Centre by signing up for our mailing list at pcp.gc.cuny.edu. We'd like to start by saying thank you to Crime Inc. Ex-Workers Collective, Aid and Abet, The Sparrow Project, Occupied Media, The Independent, PM Press, Blue Stockings Bookstore, and Team Colours Collectives for sponsoring tonight's event. 
Many of those groups, including Cramp Inc., Blue Stockings, and PM Press, are tabling tonight with books for sale, including titles by all of tonight's debate participants. I just want to make a note about the Q&A. Um, there will be a Q&A portion of tonight's event, and we will try to have the speakers address as many of your questions as possible. We're distributing note cards throughout the audience for you to submit your questions. Uh, please pass them down and to the right, and they will be collected in the front row. So if you have a question, please write it down on a card. So to introduce our speakers today, uh, Chris Hedges is an American journalist, author, and war correspondent specializing in American and Middle Eastern politics and societies. He will speak to the perspectives behind his controversial article, The Cancer in Occupy, regarding black bloc tactics and anarchist participation in the Occupy movement. B. Traven, our other speaker, will support the case for a diversity of tactics in the Occupy movement and in broader anti-capitalist struggles worldwide, illustrating an anarchist critique of the status quo and a vision of social transformation. Crime Inc. has produced many books and articles, including The Illegitimacy of Violence, The Violence of Legitimacy, composed in part as a response to Hedge's The Cancer in Occupy. Please thank our speakers uh, this evening. In his article, The Cancer in Occupy, Chris Hedges labeled black bloc anarchists as, quote, a gift from heaven to the security and surveillance state. Critics countered that the black bloc is a tactic, not a group. The, ens the ensuing controversy failed to clarify the real strategic differences within the Occupy movement. If the black bloc is a tactic, how do we evaluate its effectiveness? What are its origins? What does it attempt to do, and what is it good for? More importantly, how can these questions inform the ways that we strategize for social change? Historically, the question of violence has been taken up in various ways by radical movements. For example, in Latin America, many urban community-based organizations reflect a, a synthesis of diverse strategies that have been honed over several decades through the eras of armed guerrilla struggle, non-violent non mass movements guided by liberation theology, and cultural resistance. In other cases, from the LA riots to the French and more recent UK riots, violence is the express expression of anger and resistance. What means of action do social movements have at their disposal, and why do they choose certain tactics at certain times? To get to the root of these differing perspectives, tonight we will separate the black bloc tactic into its constituent elements and discuss them one by one. We will address the roles of illegality, anonymity, and violence in social movements, and conclude by asking what our differing conceptions of these indicate about our visions of transformation. Um, okay, so now I'd like to open for opening statements, first by Brian. I, I, I'm here basically to represent our ideas in this venue that we don't usually work in because we think it's really important to be able to put a public face on a perspective that is usually invisibilized, is usually swept under the rug. And I want to clarify also, uh, I'm not here tonight to try to persuade you all to utilize the black bloc tactic. Uh, if at the end of the night everyone pulls up the hoods of their sweatshirts, pulls on masks, and goes out in the street together, that might not even be a good idea. Uh, <laughs> what I am here for is to talk about what is contemporary about this tactic and why it has spread. What can we learn from it in, uh, in social movements generally? Uh, similarly, I'm not here to argue for violence. I'm here to argue for a more nuanced analysis of the use of force than the violence-nonviolence dichotomy, which all of us are familiar with, and which some of us believe plays into the hands of the state in framing the narratives of social struggles. Uh, as Sarah spoke about, Occupy is not in the streets right now. It's possible to argue that it reached an impasse, and at these impasses, it's especially important that we take a step back make use of the lull to, to strategize, to brainstorm, to figure out what the, what the way forward is. And in this, in this impasse, it's uh, not only can we, can we learn from why it is that black bloc tactics have taken off since Germany in the 1980s, uh, also it's interesting to look at why the black bloc has been a bugaboo, why it has been useful to, uh, 
to, to demonize this particular tactic. You know, first of all, to frame it as a static group, a social body that can, uh, that can be alienated from, from the rest of the movement, that can be demonized, rather than being a tactic that anyone could potentially participate in. And perhaps the Black Bloc is also, uh, is also singled out as a bugaboo to scare us away from tactics that perhaps we need to be able to advance the social movements that we want to participate in. As I said, I'm not, uh, I'm not familiar with being on stages like this. Uh, I'm not a, an expert. I'm like y'all. I'm just a, one more participant in the, in the struggle to get more leverage over our lives that, that we are all engaged in. Uh, I will speak from my own experience, uh, and I'll try to, uh, try to just speak from my heart. So thank you very much for coming and being here. I certainly support diversity of tactics, uh, and I would argue that the black bloc is an impediment to the capacity uh, to have diverse tactics, uh, because when you build a nonviolent protest, uh, and the black bloc appears and turns that protest into one uh, which violates those nonviolent principles, you make diversity of tactics impossible. Um, my problem with Black Bloc is precisely that, uh, that they uh, have used the Occupy movement uh, essentially to carry out activities that have diminished that movement. Uh, I, I have a hard time understanding uh, what their goals are and how they think these tactics are going to achieve those goals. Uh, I covered revolutions, insurrections, most of the revolutions in Eastern Europe, five years in El Salvador, uh, uh, the two Palestinian uprisings. Uh, I was in Sarajevo during the war. I'm not a pacifist. I understand that there are moments in human history when armed forces seek to destroy you, as they did in Bosnia. Uh, to sit in a basement in Sarajevo when we were being hit with 2,000 shells a day, constant sniper fire, four to five dead a day, two dozen wounded a day, and begin a discussion about pacifism would have evoked gales of laughter. Um, so uh, there are moments when uh, violence, and I find having been around violence as a war correspondent for 20 years uh, always tragic, uh, violence uh, the, 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 there are some groups that set out to annihilate you and make any other response uh, impossible. And, and uh, one can look at the genocide of Native Americans as a good example of that. Um, all of the attempts on the part of Native American communities uh, to uh, build any kind of a relationship with the white European settlers failed, not in small part because the Europeans violated every single one of the 400 treaties uh, that they established. Um, so I think that the, the goal of the movement, uh, and we see it in Chicago, uh, is to uh, bring the kinds of numbers into the street, to make it a mainstream movement, and I think that was the power of Occupy, that it was mainstream. I would also like to say that Occupy itself was a tactic, uh, and I don't buy this uh, argument that Occupy is dead. Um, Occupy is not dead. Um, look at the streets of Chicago. It may not be called Occupy, but if you've been following that strike, the most important strike in, uh, in recent memory, in probably a few decades, when those teachers uh, go into the police stations, when they're out on the street to use the bathrooms, the police will applaud. And that terrifies the corporate state. Because in every revolution that I covered, when the pillars or the foot soldiers of control can no longer be counted upon to defend a corrupt, fragile uh, uh, ruling elite, uh, then that elite is in danger. And, uh, and, and, and I think throughout human history we have seen, even in the Russian Revolution, that what tips the balance is the capacity to bring the mainstream out in the street, usually through nonviolence. The Russian Revolution 
uh, was largely a nonviolent revolution. It was when the Petrograd riots took place, they sent the Cossacks in to uh, quell the riots, they began to fraternize with the rioters, and, uh, and the Tsar abdicated within a week. Thank you to you both. Uh, is my microphone working? It's okay? I've turned it on. Yeah. Okay, thank you both for those opening statements. I just want to, before we begin, remind everybody how the format will work. It's going to be a fairly um, uh, tight uh, moderated debate with the, first per the person who is asked the question will have four minutes to answer, the other person will have four minutes to answer, and then the first person will have another two minutes to respond. Um, I'd also like to remind people out of respect for the speakers and respect for their points of view, if you could please refrain from shouting out or making comments while people are talking. Okay, so the first question um, will be to Brian. Uh, do illegal tactics have a place in social movements in the United States? Who do they alienate or exclude, and who do they empower? Well, the town that I come from, a small southern town that likes to think of itself as liberal, had an occupation uh, as, as all the way through January, and um, we had an encampment. And when it finally came down, only then did we find out for sure that uh, what we had been doing was illegal. Um, we, we intercepted a a memo from the town manager asking to begin enforcing the laws again. Not only had the encampment and the protests that we'd organized been illegal, but in fact, assemblies of more than a dozen people had been illegal. So everything we'd done had been illegal. In effect, we had participated in a criminal conspiracy to violate the ordinances of our little town. Now, I think many of the participants who at the end felt entitled to participate in the actions that they had throughout the, those months, if they'd known that they were embarking on this criminal conspiracy, would have, uh, would have been intimidated, would have maybe decided not to. This is one of the results of conflating legitimacy with legality. At the end, you know, at the end of the event, they were, they were proud that it had happened. They were proud to have participated in it. Now, of course, instead of having an occupation, we could have mounted a legal campaign to try to change the laws. But such a campaign would have prioritized the agency of the middle class people and the people who already knew how the system worked, the people that were best served already by the system. And it wouldn't have been a participatory movement. Our, our occupation in my t small town was illegal and participatory for the same reasons. Now, to emphasize this, that we can't conflate legality with legitimacy, um, this, is, this is a reason why I don't think we should use the word criminal as a pejorative, especially when the criminalization of huge parts of our population is, is an essential part of the perpetuation of white supremacy. In the Cancer and Occupy article, Chris Hedges used the word criminal as a pejorative. When we do this, we legitimize a weapon that the state can use against all of us, including Hedges and myself, but especially against the most vulnerable and most disenfranchised populations. It's also uh, legitimizing a weapon that can be used to intimidate even uh, well-intentioned middle-class people out of starting the kinds of protests that we will have to participate in to shake things up. Now, I'm sure that Mr. Hedges appreci appreciates and agrees with most of what I've said, but what I want to hammer home here is that legal and illegal is the wrong question. T the question we have to ask about tactics is, do they give us power over our lives and the environments we live in? You know? Do they, we not just appeal to the you know, to the conscience of those who rule us, or to the general public as an abstraction seen through the corporate media, but do we actually get a sense of our own strength through the tactics as we use them? Now, Hedges has said earlier that the most important thing is to get numbers in the street, and I, I want to critique this because I participated in 2003, on February 15th, I'm sure with many of you, in filling the streets in protests against the invasion of Iraq. It was, I think, the, the largest worldwide protest in history at that point, between 6 million and 15 million participated, or 30 million at the high end. And that didn't do anything except maybe help create a context in which Obama could eventually get elected. But six million of us could certainly have made that war impossible if we had felt entitled to use our capabilities to do that. It might have been called violent if we had, but it certainly would have averted a much greater violence. The, the, the place that I'm getting at with this is that our occupations also, they last longer when we are not afraid of our own strength. They last longer and they're more effective 
all of our actions are more effective when we are not just appealing, not just making a supplication, but using our power to together to the best of our ability. Thank you, Brian. First of all, just when I use the word criminal, I'm talking about Wall Street. Um, in terms of illegal tactics, uh, just any, any act of civil disobedience is considered illegal, uh, and if it isn't illegal, they'll make it illegal. Uh, this is why I sued Barack Obama and Leon Panetta over the National Defense Authorization Act. Uh, Section 1021, um, which permits the U.S. military to carry out domestic policing to seize American citizens who are deemed to be terrorists or people who are uh, related with what they nebulously call associated forces and hold them without due process in military facilities and, until the end of hostilities. Judge Catherine Forrest in the Southern District Court of New York has issued a temporary injunction, which the Obama administration, by the way, has appealed, and we are waiting to see whether that's permanent. Uh, there's no question uh, that that piece of legislation, which is a past in the name of anti-terrorism, is part of the long attempt to criminalize dissent. Uh, and we saw with Alex O'Brien in U.S. Days of Rage, who was one of the plaintiffs, that when WikiLeaks dumped the Stafford emails, five million emails, there was a back and forth attempting to link U.S. Day of Rage with Al-Qaeda. Uh, so uh, the, the debate about illegal tactics is a faux debate. Um, when I was arrested in front of Goldman Sachs, that was considered illegal. Uh, and I'm not a believer in appealing to the formal systems of power which have betrayed us uh, 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 so that basically all tactics that we use from now on will be deemed by the security and surveillance state illegal. The question is which tactics are effective and which are not. Uh, and uh, I think the power of the Occupy movement was that it was a mainstream movement. It articulated the concerns and the sense of the injustices and the grievances of the mainstream. And I think if you read the polling, it supports that, whether it's over our healthcare system, whether it's over the chronic, long-term underemployment and unemployment, uh, whether it is uh, the paralysis within the state itself to respond to what's happening to us. And mainstream, and attracting that mainstream, I think, is what terrified the state, the corporate state itself. And it's why the Obama administration led a coordinated effort to attempt to physically eradicate these encampments. For me, that was a seminal moment. Because at that point, the corporate state said, we will only speak to you in the language of force. If they could respond rationally, and Krugman in column after column appeals for a rational response, to the economic crisis, they would have, at the minimum, made a moratorium on foreclosures and bank repossessions, they would have forgiven student debt, they would have passed a jobs program, especially targeted at people under the age of 25, uh, and uh, they would have given us a rational health care system. But they did not do that. And it's always the ruling class that determines the parameters of revolt and rebellion. I would argue that's what ha what's happening in the streets of Chicago is an integral part, an organic part of the Occupy movement, although they don't use the name Occupy. Remember that they essentially w turned, they turned their backs, the organizers in Chicago, on organized labor uh, because they weren't on their side and the Democratic Party, and they have essentially confronted the power structure itself. Thank you. Well, it seems like Chris Hedges and I believe many of the same things. That's why it's interesting for us to be on the stage together. I have to emphasize, since he didn't acknowledge this, that he was using the word criminal in the cancer and black bloc, or sorry, the cancer and occupy piece, to refer to many of us. He was saying the word for what many people in this room have participated in as protesters is criminal. It's really important to, to get at this and to, to understand what this does. Um, the, the thing that he said in the beginning about uh, the idea that diversity of tax can, tactics can only be imposed by a kind of uniformity, 
is, uh, is, is confusing to me also. It certainly can't be imposed by, you can't, inform, you can't impose this uniformity by a strategy of division, right? You can't impose a uniformity by a strategy that takes many of us and says, your participation is illegitimate. You are criminal. You, you need to be forced out of this movement. So I want to emphasize, first of all, that I, I think that is a losing strategy. The other thing I want to say, um, did anybody, uh, OK, the, the, the thing about Occupy and what tactics alienate people. I, I want to return to what I was arguing earlier, that the Occupies that were more confrontational, that pushed the envelope farther, lasted longer. And Occupy Oakland, for example, if you believe the, uh, the Adbusters statement that came out after May Day, maintain momentum significantly after, for example, Occupy Minnesota, you know, or, or many other occupations, right? Why is this? And the Chris Hedges of the world will say that the problem is that we, um, that we, us militant protesters, are alienating everybody else. And I want to call attention to everyone, uh, to call to everyone's attention that in uh, February of 2012, after, the, uh, after all of the protests, all of the black blocks that had been described as taking place in the Bay, the Oakland Tribune ran an article. Uh, Brian, yeah. you could wrap up. Oh, I, I, yeah. A, a poll. 10,000 people were, were uh, polled. Do you support Occupy Oakland? 94% said yes, after everything. Cut you off there. Thank you. Thank you. The next question. The next question is to Chris. Um, one of the controversial aspects of the black bloc is that it enables people to act anonymously in a group. What are the benefits and drawbacks of participants in social movements being able to preserve their anonymity? What are the effects of a movement based around public figures and transparent organizing? Well, acting anonymously in a group is a gift to the surveillance state because they can cover their faces uh, and uh, essentially hide their identities. Um, I mean, this is a difficult question because as the sophistication of uh, profile, electronic profiling increases, um, to step out into the street even for a nonviolent demonstration uh, means that you can be instantly identified. Um, however, I think in the end I come down with Václav Havel in his 1978 essay, The Power of the Powerless. Um, we can't beat the security state at their own game. Uh, it's only, as Havel writes, by living in truth, by exposing the charade, the fiction of American democracy, uh, and, uh, and refusing to pay homage to that fiction by having complete and utter transparency that we can survive as a movement. Um, this is not a moral question, by the way. It's a tactical question about what will work. Um, I, I, as I mentioned before, I have been in conflicts. The war in El Salvador would be one. Uh, Bosnia would be another, uh, where unfortunately the uh, violence employed by the dominant class did not allow resistance to take any other form than violence. Uh, but I think we still have enough space. Uh, and I think that, that it's important. Remember, we're fighting to not only build a movement, but build a consciousness. And that consciousness will come only when we bring people into the streets. Uh, one of the beauties of Occupy was precisely that educational aspect. After they shut down Zuccotti Park, in November, um, the constant refrain I would hear is a kind of mourning uh, for the library itself. Um, and, and, for, and I think that that was, again, one of the aspects of the Occupy movement that deeply disturbed um, the power elite, that ability. And you went to Zuccotti on weekends, and there would be mothers and fathers uh, you know, pushing strollers up and down the street. That, that, that is far more terrifying uh, to the elite uh, than a small group of people uh, with their faces covered going through the street chanting or you know, throwing rocks or tipping over trash cans. What are the effects of a movement built around public figures? You can't build a movement around public figures. I mean, that was also the beauty of Occupy in that uh, it wasn't horizontal, it was vertical. 
uh, and, uh, and I think that that's extremely important. I mean, in that sense, I, um, you know, I, I'm with the anarchists on that, um, that you don't want to build those horizontal structures. Uh, and, uh, um, and finally, uh, you know, the transparency of organizing, uh, I, don't, I just don't think we can beat them at their own game. Uh, you know, having covered uh, these kinds of uh, issues for the New York Times, it gave me a kind of window into the power, the frightening power of the security and surveillance state and the, and the, you know, the tens if not hundreds of millions of dollars they have at their disposal. Uh, it, it's just, you know, to follow that route, I think, is, is uh, probably to guarantee our, our own defeat. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, we always, in the street as well as in the newspapers, we, we hear this over and over. Why don't you show your face? You know, be a man, this kind of thing. Um, it reminds me of the, what the judges and prosecutors always say when my favorite political prisoners are facing the bench. They say, you cowards, you know. Why, why, why did you take such a cowardly route? Um, from the Boston Tea Party, and probably before until now, anonymity has been an important part of almost every powerful social movement. This is not a coincidence. The Zapatistas, whom I, I know Hedges has spoken highly of, uh, <clears throat> took great pains to legitimize the wearing of the balaclava. Closer to us, um, in terms of our national context, in Quebec, the student strike earlier this year that Hedges has also spoken highly of, um, one of the main ways that the government cracked down upon that was by passing a mask law. Now, and in the age of live stream, if you call in sick to work to go to Zuccotti Park, you had better be wearing a mask, right? This explains why many of us who are on probation or who have uh, vulnerability in our immigration status, who are taking much greater risks than middle class people who have secure jobs, opt to be anonymous. And I want to emphasize this, a movement that only legitimizes transparency marginalizes the vulnerable, right? Marginalizes those who, who are most at risk in the society. And I will not tell those who are more vulnerable than myself that their masks should be off, that their faces should be exposed so that th they will look good for the cameras you know, so that my idea of strategy can be advanced. I, I consider that irresponsible. And the people for whom there is little risk to going with their faces uncovered, to participating in these movements, which, as Hedges has emphasized, are often illegal, uh, you know, the, the people who face less risk can't win even what they want alone. A movement that only legitimizes transparency it can't even win what the middle class wants. And I want to say, this is no lunatic fringe we're talking about again. This is many of the people in this room and many people around the country. And the question always comes up, how will we be accountable to each other? We have to be accountable to each other. We're in this movement. We know each other. The people in black blocks who are taking special risks have to be accountable to each other and also have to take very seriously the question of how others will feel about what they do. They're taking greater risks than, than anyone else. It's more important to them. Finally, about the question of agents provocateurs. I have known agent provocateurs personally. I have seen how they operate. It's not an abstract question for me. And I want to say the greatest risk and the greatest danger that they have posed to other people has not been when they were wearing masks. If anybody listened to, uh, to Democracy Now! about the events in Austin recently, it's not when you're wearing a mask that you can do the most harm as an agent provocateur. The black bloc has come about in a time when there is this increased surveillance. And the main way that this surveillance state represses us is through isolation and neutralization. Uh, you know, isolating and neutralizing those who pose the most threat. Uh, masking is a response to this. It's a strategic response. And I, I don't think that, that the uh, arguments against it that are framed as strategic outweigh the, the benefits of a participatory movement. Finally, it may be, Mr. Hedges, that your face on the other side of the rifles of the police will persuade them not to shoot, but some of us, whether we mask or not, they don't hold back.
If this was an issue that was based solely around masking, uh, I'm willing to concede many of these points, uh, given the intrusion of the security and surveillance state. The problem is that for me, with the black block, the masking comes with other tactics. Uh, and you talk about the vulnerable. Uh, if, you know, and there were weekends that I was in here with my small children, uh, if you are an elderly person, if you are disabled, uh, and you are joining a group that you think is nonviolent, and there becomes black block action uh, that provokes a, a response from the police or tear gas, you can't get away in the same way that, uh, you know, somebody who's alone and, 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 and young and able to sprint down a road can. Um, but I, I think the issue you raise is a legitimate one. And uh, when you look at the sophistication uh, that is now being employed, uh, you know, you, anybody who went to Zuccotti saw that platform up there and they were filming night and day. Uh, and uh, so I think on the issue of masking, I'm willing to concede it. I, I, I just, for me, the problem is that the masking comes with other tactics that I think are counterproductive. <laughs> the next question is to Brian. What is violence and nonviolence, and who gets to define them in the context of social movements? Thanks. Um, I want to emphasize that this is not an abstract question for Chris or for me. Uh, Chris is a war correspondent, as he's pointed out. Everywhere he looks, he sees ethnic cleansing, even if it's just a kid with a spray paint can. <laughs> I am uh, I, I'm here coming from uh, my history of participating in social movements. Uh, that, is, that is what I draw on to speak about this. When I think of violence and nonviolence, I think about an afternoon in Quebec City in April of 2001, the protests against the Free Trade Area of the Americas uh, Summit. Um, the police making no distinction between so-called violent and nonviolent protesters filled the entire city center with tear gas. They were shooting uh, rubber bullets at us. Um, and in that situation, I would not, myself and the 50-some-year-old mother of two that I was there with, we would not have been able to breathe if it had not been for the people in black taking those tear, tear gas canisters and throwing them back. You know? They were the only people between us and hospitalization. And they were the only reason that we were able to stay there since the police wanted to clear us out in the same way that the occupations last fall were cleared out. Now, the next day, when the newspapers came out, the front page news, news read, violence erupted when black clad protesters began hurling tear gas canisters at the police. <laughs> and this, says, th this shows to me how this discourse of violence works in, in our society. Violence is indistinguishable from code for legitimate, or illegitimate, sorry, illegitimate use of force. Now, that's why when the slumlords force your rent up, uh, that's not violence, but when you resist an eviction, that's violence. That's why dumping carcinogens into a river is not violence, but sabotaging the factory that does this is violence. That's why uh, putting 2.3 million people in prison in this country is not regarded as violent, but trying to de-arrest someone, trying to rescue them from the hands of the police is called violent. Defining as violent is a way to delegitimize people, to exclude them from the field of legitimate discourse and to justify the use of force against them. Uh, it, it came up earlier tonight that in Egypt, um, Obama him, himself called this a nonviolent revolution when there was tremendous interchange of projectiles with the police, when they burned down, I'm told, 99 police stations and the, the headquarters of the ruling party. I want to say that was nonviolent, that was deemed nonviolent because they won because it was necessary after the fact, after they had won, to say that what they had done was legitimate. If we start out saying, we will be nonviolent, we're nonviolent, from the beginning, we cede that whole territory. We say, we will only do what is already recognized as legitimate in the society. Uh, and this, this equips people like UC police captain Margot Bennett in, uh, in her quotation after a Berkeley conflict to say, those students were being violent. They refused to unlink their arms. Now, I always hear this, this critique 
when, when, I, when I advance these, these, these points, I always hear the critique, but they want us to get violent because it's a, it's a battle they can win. I want to clarify this because it's imprecise. It's not that they want us to get violent. The best thing would be if we remained inactive or only involved in harmless pacifist action, staying inside the, uh, the, the free speech zones and, and refusing to defend ourselves. That would be ideal. But if we're going to do something specifically, they want us to pick battles that we can't win, right? They want us to escalate into, for example, clandestine armed struggle as uh, Derek Jensen, who I believe is Chris Hedges' friend, endorses. <laughs> Now, it, it, and I want to say clandestine insurgency is absolutely the wrong direction. We can't win that kind of struggle. What they fear most is us collectively uh, employing a diversity of tactics and becoming collectively unrulable, becoming collectively impossible to control. And that looks, participating in that looks very different to, to all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Well, having been in various conflicts around the globe, I can assure you that the security and surveillance state could care less about people throwing rocks or breaking windows, um, especially when you're dressed in Kevlar and you're carrying automatic weapons. Um, that becomes a mechanism which does not in any way seriously threaten in an existential way security forces what it does is solidify those security forces or bond those security forces to a corrupt ruling elite. Uh, I covered the breakdown of East Germany. That was at least until the United States in the current era, the most, uh, had the most sophisticated system of internal security in the world, the Stasi state. And uh, you mentioned earlier the Iraq demonstrations, the problem was not the demonstrations, the problems is that, is that we were unable to sustain them. And the anti-war movement voluntarily gave them up in 2004 because it foolishly thought electing John Kerry, who was no less militaristic than George Bush, uh, was a good tactic. It was, turned out to be a very stupid tactic. Um, the, uh, the, the, the protests in Poland, in in East Germany were ones that went on for months and months. And, orig and they originally in Leipzig, and I, I was there, were, were pulling just a handful, a few dozen people, maybe 100, 200 people, and then in September of 1989, suddenly 70,000 people were out into the streets. You never know what ignites a population. That's one of the mysteries of uprisings. And Eric Honecker, the dictator of East Germany, sent down an elite paratroop division to fire on the crowd. And when they got there, they wouldn't do it. And Honecker lasted, after 19 years in power, another week. Uh, the same was true in Prague. Uh, it, it doesn't always work. Um, there are uh, times when mass movements, 1979 in El Salvador, which I also covered, when they brought huge numbers of labor union student people in the street and the response of the uh, Salvadoran security forces was to set up machine guns on the roofs of buildings and carry out a massacre which triggered the insurrection. Uh, but we haven't yet seen that kind of violence and I would remind you that in Egypt they gunned down 800 people uh, and they also captured thousands of people and tortured them, disappeared them, tortured them to death. And anybody who has covered uh, as I have, the, the military complex uh, understands the killing potential, which I see our mass media now celebrating with this uh, book, No Easy Day. Um, these, let's be clear, are death squads, uh, 60,000 special forces operations. And when empires crumble, and they crumble from within, which is what's happening, the forces of control on the outer reaches of empire migrate back to the center. And having spent two decades on the outer reaches of empire, I know their capacity for violence and murder. <coughs> We've already seen it in the drug war. A night raid in Oakland is no different from a night raid in Fallujah. Um, same, same, 
outfits, same automatic weapons, command helicopters with searchlights, it's exactly the same. All of those forces are being brought back. And if you are to confront them through means other than nonviolence, then you're going to have to confront them at a level of violence that threatens them right. existentially. Okay, I want to finish making my... Uh, please keep the... Excuse me. Yes. All right, I want to finish making my earlier point. Um, okay. Please allow our speaker to speak. Thank you. Thanks. Um, we live in a time when people are getting increasingly desperate. Now, the question is not whether people are going to revolt. People are going to revolt. The question is what happens when they revolt. People are going to do things that are, you know, that today we, we see as illegitimate or as crazy. People are going to act out. That's the word for it. Now, when this happens, if there is no movement that they can participate in to act out against their conditions, they are going to act out in isolation. They are going to act out, they are going to join clandestine armed insurgencies, or they are going to be, you know, they are going to throw their lives away in a, in a way that is antisocial and unproductive. Um, the, the question is, how do we make a movement that can make the most of all of our despair and desperation, that, that can create a possibility when we, can, we are at our breaking point to push forward in a way that, that benefits all of us? Now, if we make the, the black bloc into a bugaboo and we say that all those who act out are monsters and are against the movement and are going to ruin it, then we create a situation in which these people can only act out autonomously in a, in a way that doesn't, doesn't contribute to what everybody else is trying to do. And I, I want to argue again that this cancer in black bloc, sorry, cancer in Occupy, thank you, cancer in Occupy line is doomed to separate the movement into those who are not able or willing to push it far enough for there to be social change, and those who will be isolated, like the weather underground, unable to, to bring about the change that they need. Do I have one more second? I, I, and the last thing I want to say is, about these, these uh, tactics, like rock throwing in Egypt, it's entirely hypothetical whether Mubarak could have been toppled without all of the struggle that people engaged in. Uh, as for the, the tactics that people engage in in the United States, um, Somebody is going to bring up window smashing sooner or later, so I might as well be the one to do it. We have to understand these in context. In Oakland, perhaps the reason that people have engaged in property destruction now is that when Oscar Grant was murdered a few years ago there, the police officer who shot him execution style in the back of the head did not even receive charges until there were riots in downtown Oakland. These tactics are seen as being essential ways for people to defend themselves even in the existing situation and not only to, to transform the world into, into the place that we want to be. Thanks. The next question is to Chris. Violence is sometimes associated with hypermasculinity and machismo. How would you respond to these claims? Is nonviolence any less hypermasculine, and why or why not? Well, violence, uh, let's talk about violence in terms of war. Violence is a hypermasculine endeavor uh, because it is about crushing uh, capacity for empathy, uh, compassion. Uh, nurturing. Uh, it's why in every conflict that I covered, um, can you there was allow the a fusion speak? of pornography and violence, such as the war in Bosnia, is there's a kind of explosion. Because violence is about turning another person into an object that you destroy. <laughs> that objectification uh, is classically hyper-masculine. And uh, military cultures are hyper-masculine for a reason, uh, because it is an attempt to shut off feeling. Um, you raise the issue of, 
you know, our, um, is Gandhi, for example, because he has patriarchal tendencies, patriarchy and hypermasculinity are not the same thing. Uh, as feminist writers like Mary Daly and Andrea Dworkin and others have pointed out, we live in a patriarchal society um, that comes with male domination. Uh, and in the case of this country, a, a fusion of essentially male domination and white supremacy. Um, and it is when you embrace that domination uh, that it's a, it, it's a kind of, it, it's an incremental step to, uh, uh, to hypermasculinity. Uh, and, uh, you know, one of my, um, or one of the sort of issues within wars that was always so disturbing was uh, the way uh, all of those sort of qualities, those abilities to reach out and connect with others were essentially shut down through the hypermasculine uh, culture of violence and the, erotic, the, the way violence was eroticized. Uh, and I think that, uh, you know, violence for me, and I, you know, I've written this, you know, that war is a drug. War is probably the most <coughs> powerful narcotic invented by humankind. And once you imbibe in that drug, it does what all drugs do. Uh, it severs you from human contact. And I speak to somebody who, like most war correspondents, leapt from war to war to war because I couldn't exist outside that circle. Uh, uh, but, but it's about annihilation. And finally, in the end, it's about self-annihilation. Uh, and I think you know, a lot of the great feminist writers have a lot to say about this. So yeah, hypermasculinity for me uh, is something that is frightening. And, uh, and when you act as a group, when you surrender moral autonomy uh, to carry out in a crowd or a mob, uh, which is of course what police are, you, you destroy their identities uh, so that they become a mass. Uh, and uh, uh, and it, it, it makes it uh, extremely enticing and even thrilling um, to carry out acts that are destructive and I think ultimately self-destructive. So, is the black bloc, as a tactic, hyper-masculine? Um, to say this, I, uh, I, I think there's some problematic gendering going on here. Um, <laughs> as far as whether the anarchist spaces that I've been in that have produced black blocs have been male-dominated, often they have been. Uh, not as male dominated as many of the Occupy organizing spaces that I've been in, to, to speak honestly. Um, to such an extent that that's been a, a, a notorious criticism by some of my female and queer friends of trying to organize in Occupy. Um, but really, this is just an anecdotal question. You know, you can decide that, uh, that what the black bloc does is violence and therefore it's masculine. That's, that's not my gender analysis. Um, I wanna, but what I wanna emphasize here is that Hedges has not participated in a black bloc or in organizing for one. So really what's going on here is that the mask is a reflective surface onto which people outside of it can project their assumptions, right? Um, that's all I wanna say from my own perspective. I, I think that it's, it's in poor taste for white men to use privilege politics in pissing matches with each other, to try to accuse each other of, um, of hypermasculinity or, or this or that. Instead, I'd like to foreground somebody else's voice here, uh, a woman who can't be here today because she is serving a year in prison in Toronto, accused of being the so-called leader of the black bloc at the protests against the G20 protest, uh, G20 summit in 2010. Her name is Kelly Rose Flugbeck, and she answered the same question uh, with, with these words. Patriarchal society in general is infected with a deeply disturbing hypermasculinity. Patriarchy and prejudice against people with disabilities are deeply connected, and both pressure people to believe their worth depends on whether their body is attractive, useful, normal, and non-threatening according to dominant standards. 
Many of the things that people vandalized during the G20 were symbols of patriarchy, like window advertisements with emaciated, underage-looking girls in hypersexualized poses. Being constantly bombarded with these unhealthy images is hurtful and violating to people of all genders. Global capitalism is also inextricably linked to kinds of violence and exploitation that disproportionately affect women and girls. So in that sense, any form of opposition to the G20, multinational corporations, or trade blocs is also an opposition to patriarchy. There are many documented cases of female workers in sweatshops being systematically raped because they protested their work conditions. And the colonial history and ongoing economic exploitation of the Congo is what has caused the civil strife and pandemic of gang rapes that Congolese women are suffering right now. If Chris Hedges wants to speak out about the prevalence of hyper-masculinized violence in the world, he should rail against governments and multinational corporations, not a scraggly bunch of protesters who oppose them. Now, I know that that is one of the things that Chris does. But we are here today because in practice, his rhetoric helps the state to marginalize, to invisibilize, and to imprison women like Kelly Rose Flugback. Well, I can assure you the state doesn't give a damn about what I write. Um, and somehow the idea that they're using my writings as a, as a use to imprison people or marginalize them is absurd. Um, I'm as locked out of the mainstream uh, as the black bloc. Um, you know, I'm hardly a, a figure that the establishment uh, uses uh, to uh, credentialize themselves. Um, you know, on the issue of, of violence, on the issue of diversity of tactics. Uh, if the black bloc want to carry out an action, uh, I actually think they have every right to do it. I'm not going to join them, uh, but I'm also not going to inform on them. My problem is that they make it impossible for those of us who want to build a nonviolent movement to carry out our action. And there has to be a place. Uh, there, there is a place in uh, insurgencies and uprisings for various movements. Uh, when I covered the war in El Salvador, you had groups uh, such as the Catholic Human Rights Group uh, that would document the killings by the death squads and yet studiously espoused nonviolence. And yet when I traveled with the FMLN rebels, uh, they would often give me carefully typewritten uh, testimonies by people who lived in combat zones who had suffered at the hands of Salvadoran security forces, and they would ask me to deliver those typewritten testimonies to the Human Rights Office at the Catholic Church because they knew that congressmen and others who came down would be able to hear those testimonies. And what I'm asking for is diversity of tactics. What I'm asking for is that you respect nonviolence, um, and you carry out actions that don't turn our nonviolent activities into your vision of what you think resistance should be. We have one last question before moving on to the audience questions. Uh, this question is to Brian. How do these individual issues relate to our greater visions of social change, how it comes about, and what we're trying to do? How can our tactics distinguish and free us from the institutions we oppose? And how can our tactics <coughs> embody the world we hope to create? All right. Thank you very much. I want to explain why I, I am making an effort to critique this cancer in Occupy. There, I got it this time. Uh, line. You know, I, I want to emphasize why that's an issue. Chris and I are not that far apart ideologically. Um, the one place that we differ is how we respond to the appearance of more militant tactics. Now, I, I'm with Chris. There's a time and place for everything. I agree with him about that. But that's not what he claimed in the cancer in Occupy Peace. He said that the black bloc is a, a totally distinct social body that has its own agenda that is against all of you, even those of you who have participated in black blocs. 
and that it has to be excised, like a, like a, like a medical abnormality. Abnorm abnormality? There we go. Um, this, this runs counter to my understanding of how social movements work. It, and it seems to me that we have a really different idea of how this works. Um, my theory, my, my impression from what I've seen is that in a situation in which most people don't feel entitled to use certain tactics, whether it is to do things that are illegal or to defend themselves or to, to mask their faces when they need to do that to protect themselves, in this situation, what always happens is that a few outliers try out a new tactic. And at first, it's extremely controversial. But if they do it long enough and seriously enough, and they always make the effort to explain themselves to others, eventually, if this tactic is of use, it can catch on and it can be useful to other people. A good example of this is that, you know, Occupy Wall Street was not the first occupation in this country, right? If you go back to 2009, there was an occupation in the New School that at the time was, was controversial, did not take off, was regarded perhaps by many as antisocial or confusing, and that, you know, that sparked occupations on the West Coast. Uh, and through this, this long, slow process over years, the, the foundation was built upon which Occupy Wall Street could take place. Now, similarly, people in this country are, are now trying to legitimize the wave of tactics that can get us out of the Occupy impasse. If we call these people monsters, if we take every step that we can to delegitimize them, we will paralyze ourselves and the movement for the future. Rather, we should be explaining, we should be taking advantage of the ways that we're situated, and Hedges is situated better than I am for this purpose, to explain to others why people engage in these, in these actions, why they are deemed necessary, and to, to draw from them what is useful, what all of us can apply, whether or not we ever wear a black sweatshirt. This is the, the business that we have to be humbly setting about, because as Chris said, violence isn't glorious, you know? But I also want to emphasize Everything that is called violence is, is, is not bad, in fact. A lot of it is things that if we, if we can do them, we will be able to break the deadlock of a, oppression that holds us where we are. Um, and I, finally, I want to say, if you don't want those who participate in black blocks, if you don't want those who, uh, who are part of this, this movement, to, to be able to make this case, to be able to try out new tactics and be able to legitimize them, uh, you will have to demonize us to succeed. You will have to do what you did in Cancer of Occupy. You will have to say things about us that just aren't true or representative. You will have to, to make us into monsters. And in fact, there's, there's too many of us in this movement for this to happen without, without this dialogue. Whether you want it or not, it's going to happen. And I'm not even sure that, that you want to set about this, this demonization. But to, to conclude, I want to say, what you, you said a second ago, that what you say is useless to the police, I, I don't buy it because I saw your line, word for word, quoted by, by police, not attributing it, of course, but using exactly the same framework. Black Bloc is outside. Black Bloc is not legitimate protesters. Black Bloc is chaos bent hooligans in, in newspaper coverage building up to the RNC, the NATO protests, and elsewhere. So I feel like the fact that you, as somebody who agrees with many of the people here about the situation, the fact that you, um, that you handed this narrative to the police was actually extremely irresponsible and dangerous for lots of people. Well, the reason uh, I sued Obama over the NDAA is because I knew the first group they were going to go after was the Black Bloc. Um, and, <laughs> and then they'll work their way up the ladder. Uh, they, take, they pick off the marginal groups first. Uh, they've already done a pretty good job of decimating Muslim American activists, whether it's uh, Fahad Hashmi or Samuel Aryan or anyone else. Uh, and they use precisely the same tactics. Uh, in the case of Fahad Hashmi, and he was held here in New York in Guantanamo-like conditions, 23 hours a day in isolation, naked. They never turned off his uh, bulb, his light bulb in his cell. 
what were they were pro using to prosecute him with were tapes of talks that he'd given as a student activist when he was at Brooklyn College. Uh, you look closely at the Muslim American community and you can see where they're going and what they want to do. Uh, and, and the next group they'll go after, and you've already seen it uh, in the case, was it in Cleveland, where they got these, used an agent provocateur to get these kids supposedly to blow up a bridge. Uh, uh, and, and we saw it, as I mentioned earlier, in the NDAA case where they tried to demonize U.S. Day of Rage. Uh, they know what's coming. Uh, I, I agree with Brian that we are certainly headed for a period of deep instability and unrest, and the corporate state is working overtime to create the legal structure whereby any whisper of dissent becomes impossible. Uh, so. Uh, the, I, I, I'm not going to get into this Graeber argument as to whether what I write, you know, suddenly gives the uh, Homeland Security an idea of, you know, what they want to say. Um, I, I, maybe they are. Maybe they read everything I write. I hope they read everything I write, uh, but I kind of doubt it. Um, you know, the, the, the question really comes down to what's going to work. And I have yet to hear a coherent explanation on the part of Black Bloc Number one is the kind of vision that they have for the society that we want to create and how these tactics are going to get us there. If we do not bring the mainstream over to our side, I don't think we can win. And I think what we have not raised is that this backlash could very well be hijacked by proto-fascist movements. Um, the Christian right, the Tea Party, and unlike us, they are going to be bankrolled by the most retrograde elements of American capitalism, the Koch brothers and others, just as the German industrialists bankroll the Nazi party. Political paralysis creates extremes, and the longer that paralysis continues, the more people walk away from the systems of power. And when these corporate interests feel threatened, um, they have the capacity to empower these proto-fascist organizations that celebrate the gun culture, that speak in the language of violence, and that do what all fascist movements do, which is to demonize the vulnerable. Muslims, undocumented workers, homosexuals, intellectuals, liberals, feminists, they have a very long list of people they hate. And fascism and violence run like a very dark, we are a very, very violent society. And I think that in times of instability, we cannot rule out that this backlash may be a populist right-wing backlash. And, and, and that has to be part of our consciousness when we begin to raise, uh, when we begin to raise the issue of effective resistance. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, it seems to me that it isn't just bullets or tear gas canisters with which the government represses us. Above all, it's, uh, it's, they use the narrative, they frame the narrative. Now, I, I'm sure that you believe this in the same way that I do, otherwise you wouldn't have written that the Black Bloc was giving the government the excuse to repress us. That's a matter of narrative. Um, if we create this other narrative, uh, as, as I understand it, what you were trying to do, um, you can see how that would also be useful to the government, right? And you, you mentioned the thing in Cleveland. I really appreciate you mentioning those kids who have basically been entrapped there, but it's significant that those kids were called in, in the mainstream media. They were described as black bloc anarchists, even though there's no evidence that any of them had participated in a black bloc. And that's because the, the narrative that came out of Cancer of Occupy and out of all of this invective was that whoever it is that is scary is the black bloc. Bomb makers are the black bloc. And this is very useful to the government because, well, let, what would it have taken for us to say in those occupations? Maybe feeling entitled to wear masks, maybe feeling entitled to resist, maybe feeling entitled not to be afraid of standing up for ourselves. And their, their, the narrative that they're going for, their operation is to create an environment in which whenever average Americans, whoever that is, see people who are doing the things that it would take to maintain space, 
they, they will say, oh, those must be bombers. They must be terrorists. They must be like those people in Cleveland. Do you all understand what I'm saying? And this, this, is, this, is, this is absolutely what they're trying to do. So as for what our vision of change is, like I said, like I've said throughout, using the same examples that I think Hedges endorses, our, our, our task is to expand the range of what people feel entitled to do. This, do this humbly, do this persistently, and, and not glorify anything, but just go about the, the, the business of trying to do this. We're going to be demonized, even by people that should be our allies as we do this. We're going to face all sorts of name calling and invective, but just to continue doing it courageously, unstoppably. Thanks. Uh, I'd now like to invite both of our speakers to give a four minute closing statement. So if we can start with Chris. Yeah, I mean, traditional anarchism I'm deeply sympathetic with. Uh, I, I come out of the Christian anarchist movement, Dorothy Day, um, where you have a constant alienation from power. Uh, I think the issue is power. It doesn't really matter who holds it. Uh, when Karl Popper writes uh, uh, The uh, Open Society and Its Enemies, he says that the question of how we would get good people to rule is the wrong question. Uh, most people, he says, who are attracted to power are at best mediocre, which is Obama or Venal, which is Romney or Bush. The question is how do you get those in power to be frightened of you? Uh, and you do that by building movements. The anti-organizational element of the black bloc, uh, which is not something, by the way, that, that the great anarchist thinkers of the late 19th century and the early 20th century embraced, whether that was Bakunin or Kropotkin, Emma Goldman, Berkman. Uh, they all believed in the primacy of astute and intelligent organization and effective tactics. Uh, all of the correctives to American democracy came through movements, popular movements, that never achieved formal positions of power whether that was the Liberty Party that fought slavery, the suffragists who fought for women's rights, the labor movement, and finally the civil rights movement. And you could argue that until he was assassinated in April of 1968, the most powerful political figure in the United States was Martin Luther King. Because when he went to Memphis, 50,000 people went with him. And we have no hope left unless we rebuild those movements that were systematically destroyed. I spend a lot of time in Death of the Liberal Class talking about it, starting in World War I, in the name of anti-communism, and what Dwight MacDonald calls our psychosis of permanent war. And when the Soviet Union went down, the most uh, vile elements of the power elite needed something to take its place, and it became terrorism. War, as Randolph Bourne writes, is the health of a state the ability to accrue themselves all sorts of power. And we are reaching a, a, a crisis moment as we decline, both as an empire and we watch the collapse of globalization and the rise of frightening reconfiguration of the ecosystem on the, for which we depend for, for existence. And if we don't rebuild those popular movements, uh, we will have nothing left by which we will protect both ourselves and finally the next generation from the devastation that's being visited upon us by our corporate overlords. Um, the great novel I've come uh, to believe of the American experience is Moby Dick. These figures are all Ahabs. When 40% of the Arctic sea ice melts, all they talk about is exploiting the last vestiges of oil, mineral, gas, and fish stocks. It is collective suicide. As Ahab says in the book, my methods and my means are sane, my object is mad. And we have very, very little time left. And so the tactics we employ have to be smart because the forces arrayed against us are working overtime to crush us. Chris, uh, Brian. Right. I have no uh, fantastic 
uh, inspiring closing statement. Um, I, I, I didn't prepare one. I don't usually, like I said, try to come on stages like this. Uh, I felt that this was necessary in this particular situation because somebody who has a lot of leverage and legitimacy was using it irresponsibly. And it's, it's hard for me to imagine that Kropotkin, Berkman, Goldman, and Bakunin would be sitting in the crowd here applauding as Hedges continues to hedge, I guess, and, um, and refuse to acknowledge and apologize the, the risk that he has put people at by, by spreading this narrative. Um, I want to say also the, the idea that the black bloc is anti-organization, that the black bloc is something monolithic. Uh, I want to say there are many different forms of organization that people who have participated in black blocs adhere to. This is not a matter of anti-organization. This is perhaps a, a matter of competing ideas about what kind of organization is going to be most effective. This is not a refusal of strategy. These are different strategies. We want a decentralized horizontal movement, a movement that doesn't have to subscribe all to one tactic in order to be able to move forward, a movement that is diverse and can make the most of that diversity. We won't and we cannot impose one format on struggle. That, that involves too much surgery, too much removing cancers one after the other until you find that all your organs are gone. You know? Like I said, we have to make the most of our diversity. And, and as I understand it, Hedges has revised his earlier position in the things he said and said that the black bloc is part of the movement and that people just have to understand that there is a proper time and place for everything. Oh, okay, I also want to be part of a movement with people who are not always wearing black sweatshirts. I agree about this. Um, but please, next time you hear somebody from a position of tremendous power and influence saying those poor people, those nobodies over there, they just want to destroy your movement, they're not part of it, Think twice, you know, go talk to the nobodies. See, see what they have to say about this. Um, and, and finally, if any of the things that I have said make sense to you tonight, let's continue talking with each other. Let's continue meeting and building up a powerful movement so that we can actually get out of this situation. Thank you so much, everyone. We're now going to move on to the question and answer portion. I have a lot of questions here, and I'm hoping we can get through as many as possible. So if I can ask the speakers to try and limit the responses to about one minute, if possible, to try and get through as many questions as possible. So the first question is for Chris. Um, can you explain what you meant when you called the Black Panther Party parasites? Do you still feel this is an accurate assessment uh, and the American Indian movement? I don't remember ever calling them parasites. Next question. Oh, no. what, what, I, Excuse me. Is the next there? Question. Is, do you have an article where I called the Black uh, Black, Black I can, Panther I parasites? I don't remember. It's it, it's okay, everybody. I, I I'll cite the article that he's talking about. It's the um, yeah, I, I read it right. It's the one where you say uh, violent parasites or. Violent extremists attach themselves to all social movements like parasites, the, the Black Panther Party, the American Indian Movement, and then you run through and you're the Symbian, Symbianese Liberation Army by the, by the end. Um, you say, I, I, as I understood it, that's what you were doing. I didn't write the question, but that, that was my impression. Right. H having read a fair bit of your material. I mean, the Black Panther Party and the American Indian Movement are are different movements from, let's say, the Weather Underground. Uh, the Weather Underground is sort of white, uh, privileged, and nihilistic. Uh, the Black Panther Party and the American Indian Movement arise out of uh, significant repression and violence that have been committed against those uh, communities. And yet, uh, I would argue uh, that in the case of both AIM uh, and the Black Panther, uh, it went uh, it, it gave to the state uh, a kind of uh, mechanism by which they could discredit uh, the broader anti-war and uh, civil rights movements. And that was, of course, always the tension uh, between Martin Luther King and the black power movement. King, at the end, by 1968, became a very lonely figure, uh, booed in Watts, uh, 
uh, and uh, there were huge defections from Stokely Tarmichael and others, even within his own movement. Uh, but I think that that is my fear of violence, uh, that resorting to acts of violence uh, cripple and hurt uh, mass movements and give to the security state uh, the kind of publicity and no question that the security state blows whatever activities are done by these groups way out of proportion, but gives them a kind of publicity vehicle that they loop. I mean, go back and look at the 1968 revolution in France, which was carried out mostly by labor, 11 million people carrying out sit-down strikes, uh, and de Gaulle used a kind of fringe movement that was violent and, and then looped it constantly on television to justify the excesses of the state itself. Thank you. The next question is for Brian. Would you say violence is entirely a sociolinguistic construct, or would you accept the more common usage of the term as reflecting a material event that causes harm to or violates the integrity of the human body? Why or why not? Thanks, Tracy. Uh, thanks, Tracy. <laughs> Um, can I have the card in front of me? To, I, I'm a little slow, thanks. Um, well, violence is, is a mix of all these different things, right? It's a, it's a, it's a discursive, I'm in a university, right? Is that, is that, am I using that right? <laughs> it's, a, I, it's, like a, it's a matter of discourse, something like this, right? It means different things to different people, which is one of the reasons that I think it's really important that we don't say we're nonviolent and assume that that means the same thing to everyone. That if, especially if you want to identify as, as being nonviolent, if you, if you think that's important, you have to be able to clarify exactly what that is and also protect people who don't use that language from the kind of delegitimization that the legitimization of nonviolence equips others to carry out against them. Does that, does that make sense? You all follow me? Okay, thanks. Thank thanks. you. Yeah. The next question is for Chris. Can there be a coexistence of black bloc and nonviolent tactics? If yes, in what form and what situation? I think there has to be uh, a respect for diversity of tactics. And the black bloc has to respect the tactics of nonviolent movements. Uh, I don't support uh, the vision of the black bloc or their tactics. Uh, and yet at the same time, I'm certainly not going to do anything to impede uh, you know, having them carry out those tactics. And that's what I'm asking for, that they respect those divisions. Uh, and if they respect those divisions and they call a black bloc action, uh, I, I, you know, I won't attend, uh, but I'm certainly not going to help the authorities do anything to crush them. The next question is for either um, Chris or Brian. Do you think occupying, in uh, quotation marks, is a form of liberal protest or a way of expropriating the means of existence from the privileged classes? Is it possible to do the latter without incurring the violence of the state? Well, we, we, in, the answer to that are, is no, of course, because the violence of the state was visited upon Occupy. Uh, mass movements. Uh, uh, have a kind of power uh, because they resonate uh, with the mainstream. And this movement, uh, what was the Occupy movement, what we're seeing in Chicago, is different from the civil rights movement. Uh, King needed white liberals, which proved very fickle allies, uh, in the battle uh, for uh, racial justice. Uh, but as soon as uh, racial equality uh, was uh, advanced, uh, and King attempted to advance economic justice, uh, his, the white liberals deserted him. And in many ways, the civil rights movement was a legal victory, but an economic failure. And King understood that without economic justice, there would finally never be racial justice, which is why the bottom two thirds of African Americans in this country are worse off than they were in the 60s when King was leading civil rights marches in the South. And um, the, uh, the issue of economic justice is one that I think Occupy picked up. Uh, and they picked it up because uh, 
there were large numbers of white, middle-class, college-educated kids who suddenly began to experience what people in marginal communities and people of color have been experiencing for several decades. Um, police repression is hardly anything new if you live in East New York. Uh, but it was new uh, if you were a graduate of Oberlin College and working in a deli. Uh, and uh, my assaults against the liberal class are precisely that they retreated into a kind of boutique activism of multiculturalism, identity politics, inclusiveness, and forgot the primacy of justice for the working class and the poor. Uh, and if we are to succeed as a movement, um, we've got to recapture that the economic primacy of justice uh, in order to go forward. I'll just say something really quick about this. Is occupying a form of liberal protest or a way of expropriating the means of existence? Uh, that's the question I was trying to pose, however clumsily, at the beginning. Um, if we see what we're doing as an appeal, as an, a, just a, a registering of dissent, it will not change the situation that we're in. If we, uh, if we approach it as a project of actually getting our hands on the resources that we need to remedy the, the imbalances in our society, yes, we're more likely to come into conflict with the state. And it's telling that when we set out to expropriate the means of existence from the privileged classes, we barely feel entitled even to take over a public park. You know? this, this emphasizes again how important this project of becoming, uh, becoming more confident in ourselves, it, of trusting ourselves more, of feeling more entitled to, to act, you know? not, not feeling uh, like a public park is barely the most we are entitled to, but all of the riches that we have produced in this world. Thanks. The next question is for Chris. What is different about the United States? You have embraced the Egyptian uprising where crowds physically fought police for access to and control over Tahrir Square, but renounced even verbal violence towards police in advising the Occupy movement. How can this be explained morally and practically? Well, first of all, you're pulling half a million people into Tahrir Square. Uh, that's number one. And number two, uh, the, the, the most uh, crucial moment in the Egyptian uprising uh, was when the army commanders realized that they could not call upon their soldiers to fire upon the crowd. Uh, and if you remember, there were pictures of occupiers in Tahrir Square climbing up on the tanks of the soldiers, which I think goes right back to proving my point. For me, the most effective strategy is not to confront the pillars of power, but to draw them towards us by fragmenting them. Uh, that, uh, and that's why even verbal abuse to the police is a mistake. <laughs> the police are working class. They come from working class communities. They work uh, at these financial centers earning $37 an hour. Uh, as rent cops They watch these guys walk by in their $8,000 suits, uh, and they might as well be a piece of the furniture. And the, 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 the effectiveness... The effect... The, okay, please, please let the speaker continue. The effectiveness of the movement will come with creating internal vision, divisions within these structures of power, whether it's civil service, whether it's security forces or anything else, and, and that creates internal systems of paralysis. That's, I'm, not, I'm not promising that you that will work. I certainly am not in any way defending, in many cases, what the police do. I'm just talking about a tactic that I have seen work in Eastern Europe uh, and that, that is potentially effective and I think worth pursuing. Um, there's a question, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to read it exactly, it's kind of crossed out a bit, but it might not make sense, but which are, which are fighting the state have massive support? <laughs> I was wondering, like, this doesn't make any sense. 
um, why is it that the left as a whole doesn't, why is it that the American left as a whole doesn't even acknowledge these movements? And Chris Hedges, if a movement like this in the US were to Christ, would you support it? Arise, I'm sorry. arise. It says oh, arise. Okay, sorry, it says arise. If a movement like this in the US were to arise, would you support it? Which movement? Which we are fighting the state to have massive support. I, I don't get it. Okay. Um, okay. The next question is for Brian. Has the Black Bloc ever been engaged in a protest that was successful? Did the Iraq war continue nonetheless? Did NAFTA pass? Did OWS have any victories if it can call its own in general? Well, I'm not sure how the person who framed that question defines success. My argument would be um, that success is, is a very complicated thing. You can't immediately gauge it. Um, if, if we frame success as preventing the government from doing something, that's, that's difficult. We, we rarely succeed with any tactics from getting them not to pass a particular kind of legislation, but the black bloc is not a kind of hard lobbying. The black bloc is a way for people to uh, act together anonymously, to make the most use, as they see fit, of their own personal capabilities. And in that regard, every time people engage anonymously, collectively, in an activity that they wish to, that they otherwise could not, it is a success. It's a success for the participants in that it returns a little bit of autonomy and a little bit of power to, to those who, who engage in this. Um, now, of course, we have to look at these things strategically as well, as, as Hedges is, is arguing. Um, you could argue in theory that the black bloc that happened in Seattle in 1999 that was so famous was strategic and successful in that it galvanized young people all around the country to, to perk up and to become really excited about what was going on in the anti-globalization movement. I, I'll admit I was a punk rocker in the 1990s and in 1998 it wasn't very easy to find another punk rocker who could tell you much about the World Trade Organization. By 2000, just about every punk rocker that I met could, could give you a long rundown on the IMF and World Bank and how they were implicated in oppressive policies throughout uh, the Global South. And this, this is because when you don't know what to do, when you can't imagine yourself taking any action, it's hard to become invested in the issue. It's hard to become invested in anything. You know, th this is why strategies that begin from education often have limits. But when you feel there is something you can do, however small, often you, you, you come to be really, uh, really focused on the issues and, to, and to, to learn about your agency and what you are capable of doing. In that regard, that black bloc and many others, I would, I would say, have been extremely successful in catalyzing the movements that we see around the United States now or else we wouldn't be having this conversation in the first place. The next question is for Chris. Who precisely are the mainstream that you seem so keen to let define the parameters of political action? If you are going to draw the mainstream into your movement, which I think was the power of Occupy, uh, then you've got to work within those limits. Uh, I have, like probably many people in this room, uh, serious issues with the very concept of a wage economy. Uh, and yet I think people have to be brought into movement step by step. Uh, there was tremendous sympathy throughout the country uh, for the Occupy encampments and in particular Occupy Wall Street and you saw it, uh, especially after the police uh, that first week carried out the pepper spraying of the three women who were kettled behind the netting. Uh, there was a kind of revulsion uh, at what was happening. Uh, Occupy created a discourse that had been absent uh, within the mainstream, and the mainstream responded. Uh, and 
and, and they saw that the Occupy movement articulated what they were undergoing and what they were enduring and the kinds of questions that were not being addressed and asked by uh, our class of pundits and our political leaders. And I think, again, going back to something I've said repeatedly throughout this discourse, um, the power that we have is going to be in our ability to bring the kinds of numbers into the streets that were brought into Tahrir Square, that were brought into Alexanderplatz in East Berlin with the fall of the communist government, that were brought into Wenzelau Square in the Velvet Revolution, which I also covered. If we can't bring those numbers in, um, then I, I don't think we have much chance of succeeding as a movement. Thank you. Okay, the next question, excuse me. The next question, ex The next question is from Wayne Price um, for Brian. Chris says that the black bloc makes it difficult to make a mainstream movement. Brian, how would you build a popular big movement? And then for Chris, is the mainstream all that counts? What about militancy? So I should start this one. Uh, hey, Wayne, it's nice to know that you're out there somewhere. Um, I've, thank you. I, um, I've enjoyed our previous interactions. I, I guess in terms of how to build a popular big movement. This is a, a, a challenging question today and a question that you, we could get into really deep. Um, you know, it, it used to be that you, you could just build a workers' movement. Nowadays, we, we, uh, it, we pass from job to job so fast that, it, that it's, it's really hard to hold on to any kind of situation from which we can organize with others like us. It's not surprising that the major anti-capitalist or potentially anti-capitalist movement that took off in the last couple of years was situated outside the workplace in public squares where the disenfranchised are, you know, um, or where people who have enough time between their 10 different Craigslist jobs can show up to, to participate. Building a, a movement when we are atomized like this by capitalism is, is a real challenge. The, uh, the main thing that I would say is that it's a process of building bridges and connections between people in different situations. Um, people who are marginalized in different ways. And that's why, in addition to participating in, in militant forms of struggle, I think it's very important to always set about the process of explaining ourselves and connecting with others. Um, to try to say why it is that I, as a marginally employed, uh, you know, late 30s anarchist, am involved in the things that I am. Uh, and this is, a, it, this is the, the, the closest I can give you, uh, Mr. Price, I fear, um, is, is make the effort to connect with other people who are vulnerable or targeted in the same or different ways by capitalism, figure out what we can do together, uh, and, and move forward. That's the last question. Um, this here for you, mainstream all that important. Well, the state did not look at the Occupy endeavor as a mainstream movement. They looked at it as a militant movement. Uh, of course, uh, those of us, and not only was it militant, let's be clear, it was revolutionary. Uh, because it did, as Crane Brinton writes in his study of uh, revolutions, Anatomy of a Revolution, it did finally what all revolutions do. Uh, it demanded of the state uh, terms that the state can never fulfill because it would mean its own dissolution. It asked, you know, remember they kept saying on a sort of, you know, what are your demands, what are your demands, what are your demands? Well, the demand was really clear. Uh, we want to reverse the corporate coup d'etat that we've undergone. Uh, but that's not a demand that the power elite can hear uh, because what we're asking is that they go out of existence. And that's why I think what we have unleashed is a movement. And remember, movements take a long, revolutionary movements take a long time to build. The Stamp Act or the Stamp Rebellion in 1765 was the precursor to the revolution in 1776. Uh, the uprisings uh, in Russia in 1905 was the precursor to 1917. That's what we've begun. Um, but it will change, uh, it will mutate, 
Uh, it, it, it needs to be deeply self-critical and smart. Uh, if you look at the history of the civil rights movement, like any movement, it's never a straight line. Uh, there were terrible failures in Albany, Mississippi and other places, uh, reverses, but it was the capacity within the civil rights movement or uh, within solidarity. Go back and look at the, the 10 years of solidarity before it achieved power. Uh, to understand what worked, what didn't work, what was a dead end, and what wasn't. Uh, and I think that uh, you know, we live in a period where by the language that we use to describe both our reality and our political system uh, no longer work. And in some ways, one of the first things we're doing is begin to, to look for a new language by which to describe what's happening to us. Uh, the next question is for Brian. What use is black bloc tactics when violence is used against occupiers? And they've given the reference of the live stream of Oakland protests when occupiers are protesting peacefully when black blocs showed up. Occupiers tried to protest police in a, protect pol people in a store and black bloc protesters attacked occupiers. Black bloc protesters. Okay, well, I wasn't there, so I can't speak to this in particular. Uh, it's worth saying that I am not saying that every time someone breaks a window or attacks someone else that it is a good thing. Just to clarify, the, uh, the, the heart of my point is that the criteria according to which we critique militant action have to be more precise than these people are outsiders, these people are monsters. Uh, sure, there are plenty of cases in which people do things that are uh, unstrategic or, or even downright bad, but the, uh, it just obscures the question, makes it more difficult to discuss this if every time a criticism of a specific event is advanced, it's part of a general delegitimizing of the, the target of that criticism. That's. That's the best I can do, not having noticed this event, not having been there. All right, thank you. Other question? Yeah, okay. Maybe we, no, maybe we can do, eat, do a little closing if you want to close it now. Okay. Yeah. Um, the next question is for Chris. Uh, do you support turning in Black Bloc members to the police? What levels of violence are you willing to use against those who do not fit your definition of peaceful? <laughs> no, I'm not going to turn people into the police. Uh, and what was the second question? <laughs> Look, I, I'm opposed to violence. Um, and uh, I, I really don't uh, buy this argument about, you know, uh, who gets to define violence. I'll tell you who gets to define violence. The victims get to define violence. My closest friend in high school was gay. And he was an evangelical. And, uh, his father berated him as a faggot, and the church told him he was filled with Satan and unclean, and he committed suicide. As far as I know, he was never physically touched, and yet I think his father and his church committed an act of murder. Violence comes in many, many forms. It's not physical. It can be verbal. Uh, there are many ways to destroy human beings. We have armies of uh, psychologists in Guantanamo who know without touching you how to reduce you to a fetal position and a quivering mass. Uh, and so this sort of gradations of violence, what is violence? Violence, it's those who suffer from violence, those who are victims of violence, they are the only people in my mind who have a legitimate right to tell us what violence is. Um, the next question sounds like a really big one that I'm not sure if you can each answer in one minute, but I'll put it out there and see what you want to do. Can you both please explain your theory of change? What do you each see? <laughs> what do you each see as the best strategy to build power and win material gains for the 99%? In one minute. Do you want to go first, Chris? <laughs> Well, 
whatever we do, change is coming. It's coming with the implosion of our imperium, and it's coming with the rapid degradation of the ecosystem itself. Uh, and there's nothing we can do to stop it. It's how will we cope with this change? Will we respond rationally? Will we learn to speak to the world with a new humility and recreate structures within our own communities for sustainability? Or will we continue to live in illusion? Uh, the, and, the, and, the, and the response to the climate crisis is a perfect example. We have huge half of the country that denies that climate change exists and the other half arguing that we can adapt. Both are forms of magical thinking. The fact is we can no longer afford not only the levels of consumption but the empire itself. And it's all folding in on itself. And the physical signs are around us. The collapsing infrastructure, the chronic and long-term unemployment, the fact that 46 millions Americans live in poverty and tens of millions live in a category called near poverty, the closure of libraries, of schools, of firehouses, it's all there. And, and in a way, it's a matter of awakening ourselves to our new reality and responding to it. And if we do not, if we continue to live in a state of illusion, then as that edifice collapses, we will respond uh, like people who uh, have been betrayed but do not understand the centers of betrayal or the reasons of betrayal. And when I spoke about proto-fascist movements, I think become susceptible uh, to movements which will embrace violence, but will at their core uh, be not only anti-democratic, uh, but target uh, all of the uh, the, the, the vulnerable forces within the society, whether it's African Americans or gays or, uh, or, or those of us who uh, embrace a kind of equality and inclusiveness. Thank you. Um, so I'll have Brian sort of answer yeah. as his closing statement. Yeah, we, we have to wrap up and get out of here. Um, I am looking forward to years of organizing and acting, probably with many of y'all. Um, my theory of change is uh, just keep at it, basically, right? Um, <laughs> I, the, the thing that I want, if you take one thing away from tonight, the, uh, the argument that I'm making is that when we evaluate tactics, strategies, actions, the question we should ask is, do they create a more horizontal distribution of power or not? Right? Do they equip us for self-determination or not? I don't know if we can save the world. I don't know what, what's possible. We, we can't know what the future holds, but we can invest ourselves in acting according to our consciences now, no matter what people call us when we do, in such a way that others will feel entitled to do the same. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to just add my own um, closing statement as a moderator. I have to admit that I was one of the people at Occupy with the Strollers that Chris talked about. Um, I have two really young children and um, I was really disappointed that finally revolution was coming and I have to be at home with my kids. Um, but I think one of the really inspiring things to me about it was the number of people who came out offering childcare so that I could go to meetings and be part of it. And the second thing that was exciting was the number of local movements that came up. And I was a part of the Harlem, West Harlem 99% group. Is there anyone here from the West Harlem group? Yay, Ellie. <laughs> um, so, you know, I, uh, that was one of the very inspiring things about what Occupy did, I felt, was it took the debate out of where it usually happens and took it out to the communities and took it out to the boroughs and took it out all over the place. And, and that's kind of what I'd like to see happen with this debate too. I'd really like it to see broadened to, to issues about you know, police brutality against communities of color, to, to take up issues and be very relevant within um, you know, a broad range of communities. And this has been a really, I mean, I think this is an important and a very interesting debate. And I would like to thank both of our speakers for being very eloquent and for making my job as a moderator very, very easy by keeping to their time limits uh, very well. And, Thank you very much to the audience for being here as well.
about it. It's all right. I mean, I made one, you know. Active on the streets in Oakland and other cities are the cancer of the Occupy movement, close quote. Um, he accused them of uh, knee-jerk antipathy to organization, hyper-masculinity, and of turning a protest whose success depended on its Gandhian principles of anti-violence into sort of a battle that most Americans cannot relate to. Um, David Graeber, who some of you may know, um, an activist and anthropologist, author of Debt, um, all around Occupy guy, um, countered that the black bloc is a tactic, and not a group, and that Hedges put fellow activists in danger by singling them out to be excised from the movement. Susie Cagle, a journalist covering Oakland, noted that regardless of activist tactics, the media regularly failed to report police actions as violence, um, and there was little that activists could do about that. Um, she also noted that black box in many instances helped the larger protest, um, for instance, by cutting through a fence to get people out of a kettle. Um, and they both noted, along with Crime Think, who's a co-sponsor of the event tonight, um, that the definition of violence depended on framing. The Egyptian protests that removed Mubarak were dubbed peaceful, but involved, of course, throwing rocks at police officers, setting police stations on fire. Um, but these were dubbed peaceful protests. Um, Additionally, of course, the first window to be broken in Occupy in New York was a cop putting someone's head through a window. Um, so there's a lot of the question of what defines violence is going to be discussed tonight. Um, so our esteemed panelists are going to talk a little bit about what um, what it means to to what what defines violence within a social movement, what its place is. Um, and so I'm going to raise one sort of last question of context rather than getting into what they are going to discuss. Um, so we're having this discussion about tactics when Occupy is in fact no longer in the street. It may be again, but it's not now. Um, and it's a little difficult to have a discussion of appropriate tactics without um, a sense of the context in which you're going to deploy them. Um, Occupy has been ideologically diverse from the get-go. Um, it admirably drew a cross-section of the country, and it, from the get-go, included anarchists, um, socialists, and sort of labor people used to a higher degree of sort of organization. Um, and a lot of liberal students, working people, who may not have a huge amount of experience on the left, but were very committed to the movement. Um, and they're typically sort of disillusioned with Obama, unhappy with Wall Street. Um, many, many of these people who are sort of newcomers to left left politics in a sense um, are I think I, I think that sort of diversity within the movement makes this conversation extremely valuable so when you when you think about tactics when you make choices what is at stake what are the histories of these tactics um, the debate over tactics has been a little bit muddled I think in part because with the diversity of people within the movement I'm going to wrap up. Um, you have a diversity of goals. And it's a little difficult to talk about what is the appropriate tactic without having a sense of what the appropriate goal is that you are working toward. And so I would say that now as we begin um, you know, discussing, discussing tactics between people with fairly different ideological orientations probably and what they want out of Occupy, it may, in fact, raise the question, and perhaps this will be brought up in the questions, um, you know, if Occupy returns to the street, it's not clear to me how we will continue this discussion here without the discussion that has long been avoided within Occupy, which is, what are we fighting for? What, is, what are the specific things that we want? And so I will leave you with that. I'm going to introduce our lovely moderator, and then I will leave you to the debate. Um, our moderator is uh, Sujatha Fernandez um, of the CUNY Grad Center. She is an associate professor of sociology at Queens College and the Graduate Center, City University of New York. She's the author of several books on urban politics and culture. The latest is Close to the Edge in Search of the Global Hip Hop Generation, um, published by Versa. She has written about the Occupy movement and recent global uprisings for the New York Times and the Huffington Post. So give them a hand. Thank you. 
Thank you, Sarah. The Centre for Place, Culture and Politics is pleased to host tonight's event. The centre is a nexus of critical scholarship at the CUNY Grad Centre, and it's directed by the Marxist urban geographer David Harvey. David, whose scholarship many of you are no doubt familiar with, will be in conversation with Chris Hedges later this month at the Brooklyn Book Festival on September 23rd, so you can check their website for details. You can also, also stay informed about future events hosted by the Centre by signing up for our mailing list at pcp.gc.cuny.edu. We'd like to start by saying thank you to Crime Inc. Ex-Workers Collective, Aid and Abet, the Sparrow Project, Occupied Media, The Independent, PM Press, Blue Stockings Bookstore, and Team Colors Collectives for sponsoring tonight's event. Many of those groups, including Crime Inc., Blue Stockings, and PM Press, are tabling tonight with books for sale, including titles by all of tonight's debate participants. I just want to make a note about the Q&A. Um, there will be a Q&A portion of tonight's event, and we will try to have the speakers address as many of your questions as possible. We're distributing note cards throughout the audience for you to submit your questions. Uh, please pass them down and to the right, and they will be collected in the front row. So if you have a question, please write it down on a card. So to introduce our speakers today, uh, Chris Hedges is an American journalist, author, and war correspondent, specializing in American and Middle Eastern politics and societies. He will speak to the perspectives behind his controversial article, The Cancer in Occupy, regarding black bloc tactics and anarchist participation in the Occupy movement. B. Traven, our other speaker, will support the case for a diversity of tactics in the Occupy movement and in broader anti-capitalist struggles worldwide, illustrating an anarchist critique of the status quo and a vision of social transformation. Crime Inc. has produced many books and articles, including The Illegitimacy of Violence, The Violence of Legitimacy, composed in part as a response to Hedges' The Cancer in Occupy. Please thank our speakers uh, this evening. In his article, The Cancer in Occupy, Chris Hedges labeled black bloc anarchists as, quote, a gift from heaven to the security and surveillance state. Critics countered that the black bloc is a tactic, not a group. The, ens the ensuing controversy failed to clarify the real strategic differences within the Occupy movement. If the black bloc is a tactic, how do we evaluate its effectiveness? What are its origins? What does it attempt to do, and what is it good for? More importantly, how can these questions inform the ways that we strategize for social change? Historically, the question of violence has been taken up in various ways by radical movements. For example, in Latin America, many urban community-based organizations reflect a, a synthesis of diverse strategies that have been honed over several decades through the eras of armed guerrilla struggle, non- The problem with black bloc is precisely that, uh, that they, uh, have used the Occupy movement uh, essentially to carry out activities that have diminished that movement. Uh, I, I have a hard time understanding uh, what their goals are and how they think these tactics are going to achieve those goals. Uh, I covered revolutions insurrections, most of the revolutions in Eastern Europe, five years in El Salvador, uh, uh, the two Palestinian uprisings. Uh, I was in Sarajevo during the war. I'm not a pacifist. I understand that there are moments in human history when armed forces seek to destroy you, as they did in Bosnia, uh, to sit in a basement in Sarajevo when we were being hit with 2,000 shells a day, constant sniper fire, four to five dead a day, two dozen wounded a day, and begin a discussion about pacifism would have evoked gales of laughter. Um, so uh, there are moments when uh, violence, and I find having been around violence as a war correspondent for 20 years, uh, always tragic. Uh, violence, uh, the, 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 there are some groups that set out to annihilate you and make any other response uh, impossible. And, and uh, one can look at the genocide of Native Americans as a good example 
of that. Um, all of the attempts on the part of Native American communities uh, to uh, build any kind of a relationship with the white European settlers failed, not in small part because the Europeans violated every single one of the 400 treaties uh, that they established. Um, so I think that the, the goal of the movement, uh, and we see it in Chicago, uh, is to uh, bring the kinds of numbers into the street to make it a mainstream movement, and I think that was the power of Occupy, that it was mainstream. I would also like to say that Occupy itself was a tactic, uh, and I don't buy this uh, argument that Occupy is dead. Um, Occupy is not dead. Um, look at the streets of Chicago. It may not be called Occupy, but if you've been following that strike, the most important strike in, uh, in recent memory, in probably a few decades, when those teachers uh, go into the police stations, when they're out on the street to use the bathrooms, the police will applaud. And that terrifies the corporate state. Because in every revolution that I covered, when the pillars or the foot soldiers of control can no longer be counted upon to defend a corrupt, fragile uh, uh, ruling elite, uh, then that elite is in danger. And, uh, and, and, and I think throughout human history we have seen, even in the Russian Revolution, that what tips the balance is the capacity to bring the mainstream out in the street, usually through nonviolence. The Russian Revolution uh, was largely a nonviolent revolution. It was when the Petrograd riots took place, they sent the Cossacks in to uh, quell the riots, they began to fraternize with the rioters, and, uh, and the Tsar abdicated within a week. Thank you to you both. Uh, is my microphone working? It's OK? I've turned it on. Yeah. OK, thank you both for those opening statements. I just want to, before we begin, remind everybody how the format will work. It's going to be a fairly um, uh, tight uh, moderated debate with the, first per the person who is asked the question will have four minutes to answer. The other person will have four minutes to answer. And then the first person will have another two minutes to respond. Um, I'd also like to remind Tonight, you're going to hear from some amazing thinkers, some amazing writers, some amazing orators. And a lot of them have differing opinions. And in this quote unquote liberal idea of the marketplace of ideas, a lot of us have a tendency to kind of butt heads over the issues that we think are strategic or moral. And tonight, you're going to hear things that might be unsettling. Tonight, you'll hear things that whatever your political or moral compass has for yourself, you might want to stand up. You might want to yell. You might want to say you disagree with it. And for that reason, we've created a system where there are note cards here tonight. And if you guys don't have a note card, please raise your hand. OK, a note card will go to you guys. If you guys don't need a note card, pass it off to someone who does need one. And what we hope to do is we hope to give everyone a space to get their thoughts out through these note cards and to the moderators so that this conversation can happen in a respectful and civil manner. It's very important that no matter how deplorable you find one idea on either side, that you don't stand up and you don't make this a road into an argument. What's happening tonight here is historic. It involves a lot of great people. And I would encourage you to kind of honor the, the system that's happening here. Um, introducing the speakers is Sarah Leonard. She's an editor at Descent Magazine. Um, she also co-authored or, or co-edited the um, Occupy, um, the Gazette, a phenomenal and beautifully designed journal. Um, she's someone I look up to a great deal, and I think she's the perfect person to introduce this very uh, ragtag group of unbelievable individuals we have at the table right now. So give Sarah a round of applause. And if you're looking for any of the cards, are around the edge of the room. The last thing I have to say is if you have an iPhone or if you're live streaming, to please try to keep your cameras pointed forward. We want to respect the privacy and safety of the people that are in the room. And so we're asking people not to film people in the crowd, but film the people that are up front. Thank you so much. And let's hope tonight will be a great night. Hello? 
Have you been following the strike in Chicago? Yeah. All right. Um, how many of you were involved with Occupy? All right. All right. Uh, I will proceed to preach to the choir. Um, Okay, so I'm here to give just a quick introduction uh, to the topic, which is over diversity of tactics and the black bloc. Um, so I'm going to start, for those who don't have it, with a very brief history of the black bloc and go from there. Um, this is a tactic that started in the 80s in Germany, particularly in response to violent police evictions of squatters, um, anti-nuclear activists, um, among others. Um, it's persisted as an element in European social movements, um, anti-austerity movements throughout the Eurozone, um, and famously in America in the battle for Seattle in 1999 at the WTO protests. Um, this is where famously black blocs smashed windows of international corporations, Starbucks, The Gap. Some of you may know the excellent song by Against Me. Um, and most recently, black bloc tactics have been employed in Occupy. Um, so, uh, for those who don't know, uh, this is your friendly black blocker. It involves dressing in black, covering your face, anonymity, and solidarity with an affinity group willing to engage in illegal actions. Um, we're here because uh, last winter, uh, journalist Chris Hedges over there wrote, quote, the black bloc anarchists who have been advised non-violent mass movements guided by liberation theology and cultural resistance. In other cases, from the LA riots to the French and more recent UK riots, violence is the express expression of anger and resistance. What means of action do social movements have at their disposal? And why do they choose certain tactics at certain times? To get to the root of these differing perspectives, tonight we will separate the black bloc tactic into its constituent elements and discuss them one by one. We will address the roles of illegality, anonymity and violence in social movements and conclude by asking what our differing conceptions of these indicate about our visions of transformation. Um, okay, so now I'd like to open for opening statements, first by Brian. I, I, I'm here basically to represent our ideas in this venue that we don't usually work in because we think it's really important to be able to put a public face on a perspective that is usually invisibilized, is usually swept under the rug. And I want to clarify also, uh, I'm not here tonight to try to persuade you all to utilize the black bloc tactic. Uh, if at the end of the night everyone pulls up the hoods of their sweatshirts, pulls on masks and goes out in the street together, that might not even be a good idea. Uh, <laughs> what I am here for is to talk about what is contemporary about this tactic and why it has spread. What can we learn from it in, uh, in social movements generally? Uh, similarly, I'm not here to argue for violence. I'm here to argue for a more nuanced analysis of the use of force than the violence-nonviolence dichotomy, which all of us are familiar with, and which some of us believe plays into the hands of the state in framing the narratives of social struggles. Uh, as Sarah spoke about, Occupy is not in the streets right now. It's possible to argue that it reached an impasse, and at these impasses, it's especially important that we take a step back, make use of the lull to, to strategize, to brainstorm, to figure out what the, what the way forward is. And in this, in this impasse, it's uh, not only can we, can we learn from why it is that black bloc tactics have taken off since Germany in the 1980s. Uh, also, it's interesting to look at why the black bloc has been a bugaboo, why it has been useful to, uh, to, to demonize this particular tactic. You know, first of all, to frame it as a static group, a social body that can, uh, that can be alienated from, from the rest of the movement that can be demonized, rather than being a tactic that anyone could potentially participate in. And perhaps the black bloc is also, uh, is also singled out as a bugaboo to scare us away from tactics that perhaps we need to be able to advance the social movements that we want to participate in. As I said, I'm not, uh, I'm not familiar with being on stages like this. Uh, I'm not a, an expert. I'm like y'all. I'm just a, one more participant in the, in the struggle to get more leverage over our lives that, that we are all engaged in. Uh, I will speak from my own experience uh, and I will try to, uh, try to just 
speak from my heart. So thank you very much for coming and being here. I certainly support diversity of tactics, uh, and I would argue that the black bloc is an impediment to the capacity uh, to have diverse tactics, uh, because when you build a nonviolent protest, uh, and the black bloc appears and turns that protest into one uh, which violates those nonviolent principles, you make diversity of tactics impossible. Um, my